Welcome to the Reduced Cyber Risk Podcast, June 24th, 2019, episode 41, Domain 2 Asset Security. Welcome to the Reduced Cyber Risk Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need to pass the CISSP exam while enhancing your cybersecurity career. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast. Join me each week as I provide the information you need to grow your cybersecurity knowledge so that you're better prepared to pass the CISSP exam. All right, let's get going. Hey, all, it's Sean Gerber again with Reduced Cyber Risk, and I hope you're all having a wonderful morning. I'm having a great morning. My kids are heading off to to camp this today, so I am extremely excited about that. They have I have five children still at home, and they are all going to camp, um, and it is an exciting, exciting time. Uh, I don't know if any of you all have children that might be living out there, but any time that you can get away from the kids or the kids can get away from you, it's a wonderful blessing, and you thank those your lucky stars for having those little blessings because, uh, yeah, it's going to be super quiet in the house, and uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Because it'll just be my wife and me and the dogs. It'll be pretty awesome. Uh, so, yeah, it's, that's, just had to get that little bit of a tidbit out there about that. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, a lot of great cybersecurity aspects uh, that are going to be dealing with training. And we're going to have it talk about cybersecurity integration is going to be the data remnants and rainbow series. We're going to be talking about data remnants as a CISSP training and what you need to understand for the CISSP exam. And then we're going to talk about some CISSP exam questions that are around sensitive data and destroying of hard drives. But before we do, one of the things I want to mention is the CISSP training courses that are available uh, to you just for individuals who listen to this podcast. You will find out that there are some great training courses that I have available on Udemy.com uh, that are around the CISSP. And they actually focus on all eight domains of the CISSP. So the training you see here, you're going to get that in on the steroids. There are going to be tons of it. Uh, and I'll go through each and every domain as it relates to the CISSP. Uh, from domain one to domain eight, and you can get all of those, as you well know with Udemy, they're bargain basement prices that are pretty amazing. Uh, the, the cool part about that is if I go to the link of reducecyberrisk.com, CISSP training, you can get those that link all in one spot from basically domain one to domain eight, and that will take you to udemy.com where you can then purchase those those courses but again you get lifetime access it's an incredible opportunity if you just want to go to udemy or to go to reduce cyber ciss.com training uh, those are some great opportunities for you there all right well let us roll on into the training today okay so in the cissp cybersecurity integration training we are going to talk about the NSA slash NCSC rainbow series. And you've heard me talk about this, especially as you're dealing with the CISSP. There's different rainbow series books that you will deal with. Uh, and one of the main questions they talk about in there is what, what is the specific book and why does it do what it does? Uh, what, what is the aspect of it? And we're going to kind of go into a couple of that right today. But the interesting part was, is I had gone through and, and been teaching the CISSP for a while and, and understood the rainbow series. And I remember being in cybersecurity now for as many years as I have, basically since 2001, um, you, you realize that this, the rainbow series are an important aspect of the overall picture, the, you know, especially at the beginning, how does this whole thing work? But I never really understood where they were. And, and you can get these all online. In the past, they were in actual books that you would get because that's how old I am. You would actually have a book, not online. But now they're all online that you can go check them out on at at, at the NSA, um, and that's basically ffast.org, IRP, NSA, Rainbow, and so on and so forth. And they will walk you through, you can see where all the books are at. But there's some key terms we're gonna fo focus on today, and this is around uh, dealing with data remnants, and that's the whole aspect of it. I kinda wanted to keep all of these domains as we talk about cybersecurity and the integration and the different uh, websites that are out there for cybersecurity. I want to focus on the specific domain that we're in and we're dealing with it because it. I was kind of jumping around a little bit and I thought, well, let's just keep it focused on what individual domain we're dealing with so that it makes it a bit easier as you're studying this information. So the key terms we need to be aware of is one first one is clearing, and this is what they call it, removing the sensitive data from an information system. So 
if you have some sort of data that's out there and you want to remove it, this is how you clear the data from that device. Um, and there's some different terms that you will get to know quite frequently. Uh, another one is purging, and this is actually removal of the sensitive data from a period of processing. So what they talk about there is it actually removes it from the processing uh, period that's occurring on that device, that hard drive, that disk that the information is being stored on. Uh, declassification is the removal of security classifications of a subject media. Now, in the previous life where I dealt with the military, we had unclassified. You had your classified networks, your unclassified networks. You, when you had classifications, your secret, top secret, and so forth, you had to remove that security classification if you wanted to be able to use that data in spaces that are outside of the, what they were designed for. Uh, a good example of that is like in the case of the Mueller report in the United States, they had those, those are classified documents in some respects because maybe they give out information about uh, individuals in this report. So what happens is, is it has to go through a process of declassification before they can do that. And, and so the, like, for example, if I get a document and, you know, I'm, I'm the author of, you even can come down from a declassification standpoint. If I'm the author of a document, I can classify that document. So I can say it's classified secret. Uh, then what ends up happening, though, is I cannot be the one that says I'm going to declassify it. I'm just going to remove this the security clearance off of that because there was a reason I made it a classification of secret. So therefore, it has to go to an individual who then has to review and say, OK, yeah, if you remove this information, it is would be unclassified or parts of it would be redacted. And so therefore, that's what the declassification process is. It's a it's a whole process, a whole way of removing that information. Uh, coercitivity. OK, see, I can't even say that coercitivity. See, my third grade education is coming out. Um, yeah, that that word <laughs> it's measured in. This is another word that I can't handle. O or stads uh, or steads. And it's basically the own OE. And this is a property of magnetic material used as a measure of the magnetic field. OK, so if you're geeking out, that's what that is. It's a big they call that OE. Now, I'm, I'm geeking on you a little bit here. Uh, just because one, as I'm teaching this, I also have learned it. I did not really know and understand how that was all set out. So it's like, oh, okay, well, then now that makes more sense versus just going, yeah, you need to purge it, you need to remove it. So this is a little level of deep detail that you may be going, oh, why are we getting into this? Well, it's just to kind of show you a little bit more around. It's not just, hey, I'm going to clear it, I'm going to purge it, and I'm going to declassify it. Because those are key terms you'll need to know for your CISSP. But when it comes right down to it, there is a little bit more backstory behind it. Now, I do know, I do know that they, we talk about in the CISSP the different types of tapes. And there's a type 1, type 2, type 3 tape. And these are magnetic tapes. And these have a coercivity of the type 1 is 350 OE. The type 2 is 351 OE to 750 OE. And the type 3 is above 75 or 750 OE. Did I say 351? Yeah, 750. So basically it was 350, 351 to 750, and 750 and above. And those are the different types of tapes that are available, magnetic tapes. And again, this is like way old if you're talking people like me. But uh, in many cases, the data centers still have magnetic tapes that I, information is backed up to. So you need to keep that in mind, especially as it deals with destruction. How do you deal with that? And it also comes down to the, the tape that uh, the magnet, magnetivity of a hard disk drive. Now, what is a degausser? Well, that is a device that generates a magnetic field for degaussing magnetic storage media. What does that mean? It basically puts this quote unquote force field and it, you put your magnetic tape in there and it's got these humongous monstrous magnets that then just basically rearrange all the bits and they no longer are in a logical path that, that allows the device to be able to point to them they all have pointers and if you have a certain file it points to a certain place on the hard disk drive if you're dealing with disk drive and the degausser will nuke that it will totally mess up those hard disk drives now as we have ssds come into play the degausser really has no factor in any of that so then you'll have to get into physical destruction uh, but bottom line is that's where you're still a lot of magnetic tapes that are out there that you need to be concerned with and worried about and so therefore that's just something to consider uh, permanent magnetic degausser. Uh, this is a handheld permanent magnet that can be used to degauss floppies. Yes, they are floppies, and they still exist. And be, you'd be surprised. There's still people using floppies. I don't, I don't know how you can use them that much, but there are probably plenty of people out there that still use a floppy drive. And if you're not familiar with what that is, it's like a little square piece of plastic. It used to not even be plastic. It was just kind of a magnet 
magnet. It was the the, the spinning magnetic drive per se on a basically flim piece of um, plastic that would hold the data, and it would just like kunk 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 kunk. That's that's kind of how that worked. Yeah, and it made those specific noises too. It's pretty scary. Um, but that that was the old um, way they used to deal with floppy drives. And they also can deal with it on um, disk platters, which is basically your hard drives and magnetic drums, et cetera. So it was basically a handheld degausser that you could go by and walk by and you would nuke a hard drive. Um, now, that wasn't used, obviously, to degauss tape. The best thing to do with tape, honestly, is shred it. Just destroy it. Uh, it makes it a whole lot easier that way. But the permanent degausser would, is just a high-powered magnet. You can be Magneto from the X-Men and just nuke your stuff. Bottom line, though, is on that, don't get close to anything you don't want to nuke. Because if you do, it's done. You're not going to use it again. So that is a permanent magnet degausser. So now if you're looking at different risk considerations for storage and media reuse, these are some key aspects for you to keep in mind. Uh, the, you need to understand the destination of the released media and where you plan on keeping it. So if you plan on storing it, what are you going to do once you release it? Where is it going to be stored? And is it going to be stored in a salt mine? Is it going to be stored in a warehouse? Uh, where, where is it going to be stored? Because all of those things will affect how well the data is kept. Uh, for an example, if you're dealing with uh, heat and age, you know, if those all of that will age the device. Uh, if you keep it for a long period of time, that will cause issues with the data. So all of those things will cause you some level of grief if it, as it relates to your um, maintaining your, your information. Uh, mechanical storage of device equipment failure. If you have, as you keep these things longer, what will happen is the mechanical devices will be will have issues. Um, they will have problems and they won't be able to last a long period of time. So your storage and where you keep it will also cause issues with mechanical failure. And bottom line is if you have these old devices, they also don't, they you can't get to replace them so you may have the hard drive but if you don't have the chassis and all of the the operating systems that go along with to run these old systems that also is a factor you need to be aware of uh, there's also a comment that your storage device segments not receptive to overwrite and we'll talk about that here a little bit further about not receptive to overwrite and what does that mean uh, but they basically won't, you You can't, it won't overwrite it at all. It says, nope, I'm done. You can't mess with me anymore and you can't make changes to it. Uh, overwrite the software and clearing and purging. So again, you've got to have find the specific overwrite software that will do this clearing and purging for you. Uh, those are some things to keep in mind as you, as these things get older, you've got to have the older software to do it. New software will not work with uh, these old systems. So you'll have to keep that. So there's a lot of legacy stuff you got to keep in mind by keeping this older data. Uh, the, as long as time goes on, you may not understand the data sensitivity of it. It sits in this big box for years. Is it sensitive? Is it pictures of my fuzzy kitty? Or is it pictures of top secret nuclear science projects, which you hopefully wouldn't keep in a box somewhere. But you never know. People do those things. Um, so again, not understanding the total data sensitivity, especially for keeping it for a long period of time. And then improper use of degaussing equipment. I struggle with this one, but knowing myself when I was a teenager, I'm trying to think what would be one thing that I would be using improper degaussing equipment? And probably, I guess, hey, let's run through the magnetic field and see what it does. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what, but basically going, playing with your friends, going, hey, I'm Magneto, watch out for me. You know, th those things, I, I struggle with why you would use it improperly because you're playing with big monster magnets that, and they're kind of, in the past, they've been pretty good size. and But now they're in a box, more or less, that you just stick the device in a box and it nukes it. But um, yeah, I, I laughed at that one, improper use of degaussing equipment so do not no horseplay with degaussing equipment that just goes bad it goes bad for everybody now when you're dealing with not receptive to overwrite some the storage device segments are not receptive to this and what happens is is that they're unusable tracks on a disk drive now i come back to disk drives again because you know we all know that they're going to ssds are more prevalent within our environment but there's still a lot of disk drives that are out there that are being used in servers um, when it, you can't overwrite the segments, it get, becomes very difficult to wipe. Um, and so therefore, if it becomes difficult to wipe, how are you going to deal with that? Uh, so you need to check these devices for unusable or damaged areas before uploading the data and making sure, like one good thing we talked about on Reduce Cyber Risk was the Amazon Glacier and how you could potentially put all of this data in the cloud. But if you run into these issues of overwrite challenges uh, one you go okay well I'm gonna do that I'm gonna upload it to the cloud well I find out I have these unusable or damaged areas how are you gonna deal with that now I will 
put a little plug out there for Spinrite by uh, Steve Gibson. It's a really good product to help damaged uh, areas within your device drives. Uh, I highly recommend that if you're going to be used, if you need to get the data off of there. Uh, but also keep in mind from a cybersecurity standpoint, if you can't get the data off of this, and if it's sensitive, you need to really make sure the best thing to do is, I mean, degaussing is important. I think it's, it's good, and, I, and personally, I think it's probably step one of a two-step process, especially if you're dealing with sensitive data, is that you degauss the Dickens out of it, and then you shred it. Um, or you know what, just shred it and be done with it, and you don't have to worry about degaussing it. But the bottom line is, is that if you have any areas that are damaged, um, and they do not give that CD away or that disk drive away because what will happen is, is if you do that, you are now running the risk that someone could get access to that data. Uh, you never know if the technology is out there. They may be able to get access to this damaged or unused spot. Uh, if it is unreceptive, again, try degaussing, re-image this device or re-image it. Um, if you degauss it, you, you nuke it. You can't really use it anymore. But those are things you need to consider if you the segments do not have the ability to overwrite. Okay, that's all I have for the cybersecurity integration. Let's roll on to the CISSP training. Okay, this is domain two, asset security. And our topic is going to be about protecting privacy, 2.3. Okay, as well, the objective is 2.3, uh, protecting your privacy, and the topic on this is data processor. Uh, so we're going to get into a lot of these different aspects, and a lot of this falls into what GDPR talks about. And if you're not sure what GDPR is, the General Data Privacy Regulation that's put out by the European Union uh, as it relates to data privacy and maintaining it. And that is a, it's a pretty large regulation that focuses on uh, managing the data privacy of individuals within the European Union. Uh, the big thing that made this thing happen to come into play, there was safe harbor in place before this, uh, but what moved it in this direction was the fact that they uh, wanted to have better access and better control of data privacy. Now, it, it's interesting because you look at data privacy from the EU is one direction, which is more or less focused around the individual and how do we protect the rights of the individual, the European Union citizen. And then you go to the opposite extreme where you have the Chinese government where it is the privacy of the state. Now, the privacy of the people is important to the Chinese government, obviously, but it's more important to the privacy or the understanding of the state and the collective. And then you have the United States, which is really kind of in the middle. It's kind of all over the place. So you get different states in the United States that are more private than others. And yeah, so that adds com convoluity. Convolute, com yeah, it makes it all messed up. <laughs> See? <laughs> Can't use that third grade education. Um, but you it ends up messing things up because you have different states that have different requirements. So bottom line is, is where this part is going to be around GDPR. Now context is everything as it relates to processing data, uh, system to process data, or is it looking at the GDPR data processor processor is defined as this, uh, a legal or a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body which processes personal data solely on the behalf of another data controller. So what, what it really basically comes down to is you have an individual who's a data controller that controls the information that from within an organization. You can outsource this to, to a third party, which would be a data processor. Um, one thing that you can see is this as an uh, way this works is, say you have a, a third party processor that does payroll that would have personal information about the individual uh, from pay, name, address, all those things that the EU considers as personal information. Actually, the EU considers just an IP address of the computer you're using as personal information. So they would have all of this data. So this, this data processor can be defined as an individual person um, that within your organization who has the authority to do this, or it can be outsourced to a third party. And, and so therefore, you need to be aware of how does that affect your company, how does that affect uh, what you're doing, and then how do you want to make sure that you document that correctly. But a data processor happens quite frequently. Uh, you just have to decide, is it somebody internally, is it externally, or is it a combination of both? Now, we talked about GDPR. One of the big aspects of them making this thing have some teeth is the fact that it is a fight. You could face fines up to 4% of global revenue. Now, 4% is a lot of money, especially with you're dealing with a corporation uh, who has a, a global presence. Um, you know, and even if you're a small company, so put it this way. So if you're making $100,000 a year, right, 
So a hundred, well, hopefully you're making more than that, but let's say it's a million dollars a year. So if you have a million dollars a year, 4% of a million dollars is, uh, what is that? I don't really know. See, I had to do math in public. And I had to think about it before I did it. So maybe what? $4,000? No, it'd be 1%. 1% of a million dollars. Okay. 10% is a hundred thousand um, dollars of a million. So yeah, 10%. So 4% would be uh, $40,000, right? Yeah, $40,000. So it's $40,000 hit. Now, that's if you're doing a million dollars of business. Now, that a that million dollars of business and you get a $40,000 hit, your margins aren't very high. That could be that could hurt. So let's put it this way. So many businesses are only making, if I said many, the, the average comes into, if you're a good business making big money uh, and you're, you're blessed, you're probably making about 8% margins on your uh, product. So, you know, anywhere from six to eight percent is what the, typically what I've seen. Again, I'm not a finance guy. I'm a cyber guy. So what the heck do I know? But I do know that typical margins from a business, some businesses have way higher margins than that. But let's just say it's a standard business is making between six and eight percent of their margin. Well, if you take an eight percent of your margin, if you're lucky to get that, then you could face fines of four percent. So you could also take a four percent hit of your overall profit. That is huge. 50% could be put in paying out these fines. Uh, so it seems like not very much, but when your margins are pretty tight, it's a lot of money. Um, so an example I have is if you got a billion dollars USD globally, uh, that's a $40 million fine. That is huge. That is a monstrous fine that would cost you gobs and gobs of money. Now, as you're dealing with the EU and US Privacy Shield, this again was previously a safe harbor. Uh, there's organizations can self-certify saying that they meet or comply with the Privacy Shield requirements and principles. Uh, so therefore, you can in the past, you could do that. You'd say, hey, I'm doing it. I'm say I'm doing it. If you want to audit me, audit me. And then you can find out if I'm actually saying doing what I'm saying. Uh, and But that's that was the US, U.S. Privacy Shield or EU U.S. Privacy Shield. There were 16 principles in total that you need to vow to uphold at least seven of them. And so, therefore, you could actually get away with not upholding them all. Uh, but those are the aspects that you had to say that I will comply with that. And then, therefore, they had the right to audit you. And if they audited you and you weren't doing at least the seven, well, then you would have to pay some significant fines for doing so, could lose that status, all of those pieces. And then if you lose status, what that ends up happening is, is now you can no longer share data between you and the EU. Uh, so if you're in the United States and you're a multinational, you've got business in the Europe and in the United States, you can no longer share data between you and Europe. Uh, that's just not good. And so therefore, uh, you want to make sure you comply with the requirements as much as you possibly can, at least seven out of the 16. Now, there's some other key GDPR terms, and one is pseudonymism. See, third grade. Uh, the pseudonym, yeah, I'm not even going to bother saying that, but it's basically using pseudonyms. And what it comes down to is, is you have, like for an example, Bill Smith is patient one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and it works to obfusc obfuscate data. So you know that in the records, Bill is patient one through five. And, but you have to have a key or a cipher to be able to determine, yep, yeah, patient one, two, three, four, five is Bill Smith. Uh, but that's a really good way to pseudo-randomize individuals and their, uh, their names. And so then you can hide the actual patient data itself. Another one is anonymization, and this is basically removing all relevant data about the person or their identity. Uh, a good example of this would be data masking, and this would be using in a SQL table. So for an example, you would say uh, input would be Bill Smith, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, for like in the case of the United States, it would be a social security number. Let's just say that would be a really bad way of identifying somebody, by the way. Don't, don't do that. Um, even if you're going to randomize somebody, just, just don't do that. Uh, the output would be then Jennifer Smith, 987654321. Okay, that is is good, but it really causes lots of challenges with that. Uh, so you have to have a cipher to understand how to reconnect the dots, um, and that's that's where you really kind of gets confusing. But it's a way to totally randomize or anonymize that individual. You would not know who they are unless you have the cipher, unless you have a way to understand and how to reconnect everything together. Now, as we deal with data remnants, some things to understand around this. This is how the, the, the data that's remaining after media has been erased. And we kind of talked about that briefly in the cybersecurity integration piece of this. Uh, it's residual data after a full erasure of disk. 
So if you go and you do a full erasure of it uh, and you wipe it, there's still data potentially re remnant on that device. You have to have a way to how do you deal with that and how do you remove that. Uh, so that's the residual data after your full disk exposure. Now, there's serious problems, especially with today's tools that you can do, because you can find out if you say, well, I'm just going to do the standard format, start out to star. Um, the, the size of these disks, it would take you forever in some cases. Also, if it, it doesn't always erase the data, it just erases the pointers of the data. So if you can go back and find tools that can go out and actually pull this data out of the disk, uh, that can be very valuable. So uh, this is why it's important that you... Honestly, if you have any sort of sensitive data, just nuke them or shred them. Uh, that, that's a better. And then run a hammer through them. Uh, you can't run the hammer through them, but put a, a, a nail through them, something like that. But it comes into data leakage and data loss. You will get that by having data remnants. Um, there, there's also ghost images on computers and CRT monitors. If your CRT, uh, these are really old, which is a cathode ray tube when they're the green kind of things. Um, those CRT monitors, if they've had a burn in for a long time, say the data hasn't, it's just always like a, a display screen, it will leave on the photo, I can't remember how they call that, but it's basically, it's a phosphorus type front end and what it excites it. And when it does that, it leaves an image, a ghost image on the monitor. Um, if you're really old like me, you've probably seen that. And so therefore what ends up happening is, is you could actually have a data sensitivity that is exposed. Now, I don't know how many more CRTs are out there and available to people. They are an extremely uh, inefficient way and they're very um, they power hungry. They suck a lot of power. So, but they are, they do still exist. I'm sure of it. Cause you see them, I walk into Goodwill in the United States and I see those in our, uh, the Goodwill's an area that they give away things. You people do donate devices and things and clothes. And then people can come in and buy this stuff, and that money goes to uh, the underprivileged people. Uh, so Goodwill has a lot of times CRT monitors in there that people have given away. Uh, but those things are, like, way old, and they are they don't work that well. But people still use them. So you understand the ghost images on computers. Now, there's a process to remove it. We talked about this a little bit earlier about degaussing. Again, these are powerful magnets to destroy the typical magnetic drives and they are important there's also the handheld degausser right that's you should not have horseplay no horseplay with the degausser just don't do it uh, physical destruction these are the da jaws of death and death and you basically run your magnetic drive through this and it chews it up into shredded pulverized pieces of metal uh, so that's a really good way to make sure no one gets it um, and it's also highly recommended for your solid state drives run everything that you don't want through there that you don't want to exist run it through that the jaws of death and it will destroy that stuff so it will it will destroy almost any media product out there um, worst comes to worst get a hammer and beat the living dickens out of it if you can't put it in the jaws of death like a sledgehammer and just smash it to pieces uh, that's a good way to destroy it as well um, when you're erasing it, delete the operation. This is basically a delete operation on the file or media type. And what I said, like I mentioned before, it really only removes the pointer or the file locations, not the data itself. It's just, just how is the data, how do you find the data through that pointer? So erasing is just not a bad, not a good idea at all. Uh, recommend that you actually do some level of software to do a complete overwrite, which will overwrite the ones and zeros to all ones. Um, but when the size of the SSD or the size of the drives today, these like mega terabyte drives, it will take forever to do that. So uh, it's almost just as easy just to destroy the drive itself unless you really, really, really want to reuse it again. Uh, we talk about clearing. This is an overwrite process and there's ways that you can get. Uh, there's some great websites out there on how to clear it. Uh, and you can buy that software specifically for clearing those devices. Again, you got to be careful on, again, a one to two terabyte device. Um, it will take a long time to overwrite this process for the media to be reused. Um, so you have to just decide, is it really worth it or not? Uh, you can write, it basically writes a single character over the entire disk, and there are very t various tools to do this. Purging, more intense form of clearing media to be reused. Uh, what it does is it then writes ones and zeros like in like seven different passes. So clearing it one time is one thing, and then purging it and basically writing over it multiple times. Uh, that's if typically in the government, if we were going to reuse something, what we would do is we would you do the DOD standard, which would then in turn overwrite it like seven times before you could actually reuse it. But realistically, these these things are so cheap today that disk drives that it's almost better off just just shredding it and going out and buying a new one. 
um, just because you'll spend more time from an opportunity cost standpoint clearing these things than to just go ahead and shred it and start all over. Transborder data flows. Uh, this is a previous domains around transborder, and you're going to have more and more personal data is moving from nation to nation, and and so therefore this you have to be able to manage it and be able to understand how this all works. Well, there was an organization that through that they came to a, a con consensus, and it was called the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development (OECD). And there's the key provisions that are in there of these 30 member states that said to how do we do transborder data flows? How do you do that? And then how do you manage that? Uh, this was issued 1980. And I know back then, 1980, the internet was pretty small. Um, it did exist. Al Gore invented it, but it did exist. And so therefore, what ended up happening was uh, the, the data flows were pretty, pretty tight, pretty small. Today's world, man, they are flowing everywhere. Data does not stay in one location. It goes everywhere. And so therefore, uh, the, these a lot of these laws or a lot of these uh, thoughts are a little bit dated and antiquated. But bottom line is, is there are data uh, trans, transferred border data flows around how do you maintain and manage the personal data. Now, there's eight driving principles of the OECD, and one is collection limitations. It's a collection of personal data should be limited and not be ga gathered and garnered too much. It should be uh, obtained by le legal and fair methods. There's no uh, basically siphoning data back on people without a legal, uh, without a proper way of doing that. Uh, the data quality means that it should be kept complete. You shouldn't take snippets of the data. It should be maintained in the wholeness of it. One thing around that is if people cherry pick specific, like you could say, just even say in news, news media, all, all news media do it in some form, is a conversation may occur and they'll take a piece of that, a snippet of that conversation, and it will be taken out of context. And therefore, to, it gives a very different perspective. And you can do that with data, whether it's video, audio, or just actually written forms. So it needs to be kept complete. And it needs to be consistent with the purpose, how it's being used. Uh, purpose selection, notification to the person, purpose or, or person around collecting their information. You need to let them know that, hey, I'm siphoning off your data. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, they, they need to be able to know that, yeah, I'm taking it. I'm copying it. It's okay, right? You don't mind. Um, and again, this is at the time of collected and for the specific purpose of why you're doing it. Use limitations, uh, they need to have consent of the person or the law of 40, uh, authority to disclose the data. Uh, how are you disclosing it? Do you have approval to do that? Do you notif notify the data is used for purposes stated in a different manner than what you disclose? So I'm going to use them for my research project. Oh, wait, then I send them to the Sun or the National Enquirer on something that you said. Yeah, that's not right. That's going to go badly for everybody. Just don't do that. Uh, security standards, uh, basically, do you have reasonable safeguards in place to protect the data? And do you have openness? You, when you develop your practices and policies were ground, the data should be communicated. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to manage it? Uh, what do you, how are you going to share it? And do you have policies to protect it? Uh, the individuals should be to be, have individual participation as it relates to what do they want to do, uh, and especially as it relates to personal data. How, are they okay with their data going across transborder? And then accountability. Organizations are accountable to ensure they comply with other principles as well when they're dealing with the cross-border data transfers. Okay, so that's all I have for the CISSP training. Let us roll into the exam questions. All right, CISSP exam questions, domain two. Okay, here's a question for domain two. What is the most correct term when an administrator is removing sensitive data from a system before putting it back into a less secure environment? Letter A, erasing. Letter B, purging. Letter C, clearing. Letter D, overriding. And the answer is C, clearing. Clearing is an overriding process for the media so that it cannot be recovered once it is quote unquote cleared. Now, as we talked about before, clearing is a very important part. Now, if you are going to be working on the DOD standard and you want to have to make sure the data is completely erased, um, then you could purge the data with doing multiple overwrites. But clearing will be sufficient in many cases, uh, especially if it's kept within the organization. Uh, you can just clear the device. Now, if you're going to be moving the device uh, to a different location, then you'd want to look at purging the system. Next question, what is the following is the most secure method of destroying data on a hard disk drive, an HDD? We have formatting, 
we have degaussing, we have destruction, and we have deleting. What is the most secure way of destroying the data? And the answer is C, destruction. All of them will delete the data in some form or another. They will. They'll, they'll all delete it and take care of it. Uh, but to ensure it's fully nuked and fully destroyed, you should, or basically it's de dead, yeah, it's shredded, uh, you should destroy it. And that's really the only physical destruction of the system itself will be the best method when making sure that the device, there's the data is not available to individuals. So again, that's a good one to think about. Destruction. All right, let's move on. All right, these are the links. ISC Squared Study Guide, Quizlet. Also, so there's a, some training from Thor Teaches, OECD, Rainbow Books, and GXA. All right, I hope you enjoyed this training from Reduce Cyber Risk. Again, check out my CISSP domain one through eight videos on Udemy.com. They are awesome, I guarantee you. And you can't beat the prices that Udemy gives you. I mean, realistically, you just can't beat them. Uh, they, they, I mean, when they have sales going on, it is like bargain basement pricing. Uh, so check them out on Udemy.com or go to Reduce Cyber Risk uh, slash CISSP dash training. Yes, CISSP dash training, and you will be able to get all of those in a form domains one through eight. All right, I hope you enjoyed this training. I greatly appreciate your time and energy and listening to me. Have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you on the flip side. See ya. Thanks so much for joining me today on my podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes, as I would greatly appreciate your feedback. Also, check out my CISSP videos that are on YouTube. Just search for Sean, that's S-H-O-N, Gerber, and you'll find a plethora of content to help you pass the CISSP exam. Lastly, head over to Reduce Cyber Risk and look at the cornucopia of free CISSP materials available to all my email subscribers. Thanks again for listening. See ya.